don't usually do this, but what I have in my hand here is a lure, one of my prompts, props. Um, and as you guys can see, it's a fishing lure. And you know, what do you do with this? Well, you try and catch fish with it, right? And depending on the size of the fish or the type of the fish, if it's a papio or ulua, right? You guys, uh, we kill it, right? <laughs> then we, uh, we either bake it or fry it or sashimi, you know? <laughs> um, you know, but, um, you know, with that as my illustration, um, you know, I'm reminded by scripture that regarding our lives, we have to deal with lures, if you will, that may distract you and I from our relationship with our Savior. You see, gang, Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And the thief that Jesus was referring to is none other than the devil. You know that he has lures that he tries to use to cover our hearts and lives with sin. He also has lures to try and enslave us and to paralyze us in sin. And he has lures to try and have us compromise our lives with sin. But as our text this morning will show, we have a caring creator, a caring savior, who comes and touches us in the midst of our sinfulness. We have an awesome God who heals our hearts that we that may be paralyzed by our sin. And we have a loving Lord who restores our witness that may have been damaged by our compromising. In other words, it's like the second half of John 10:10 10, 10, where Jesus says, "I have come that they may have life and have it to the full." So folks, if you have your Bibles, uh, please uh, open them up. Sorry, Uncle Fred, it's not a psalm. <laughs> we're, we're looking at the Gospel of Luke. And um, today we'll be looking at chapter 5. And we'll be taking a look at verses 1 to 32. And the title of this morning's message is, Let's Go Fishing. Let's Go Fishing. And before we get into our text, let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, we do keep, come before your throne, your throne of grace. And um, God, as we open your word, as I've often prayed, may we open our hearts to your word so that we can receive your word and be changed. God, teach us through your word. Give us understanding by your Holy Spirit. And motivate us to fall more in love with you because you first loved us. And God, help me to decrease and you increase. And um, may we lift up your word and may we sit under the teaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's uh, take a look at the first 11 verses where I entitled this section, So You Think You Know How to Fish, Huh? So You Think You Know How to Fish. I'm not a fisherman myself. I went to buy this lure, and I didn't necessarily know what I was looking for. Because when I go fishing, I usually just catch Oahu. And um, <laughs> waste a lot of line. <laughs> but I know how to tie a hook. But let's take a look at our text. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. It says, One day... As Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Verse 3, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, 
I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. In these first 11 verses, there are a few things that I like to point out for you note takers. The first thing I want to point out is in verse 1, we see that the folks who are crowding around Jesus to hear him speak, and and the reason I'm pointing this out is this, gang, is that when we're talking with people about Jesus, let's try our best to give them what the Bible says, not our opinion. It's something that our pastor has taught me uh, over the years is that we go to these gatherings with other believers and other pastors and they talk about, hey, I read this book, I read that book, it's really good. <laughs> and one of the things that Pastor Tim would always say is, well, how does it line up with Scripture? What does the Bible say about it? And sometimes it kind of pops their balloon. He's not trying to be a party pooper, but his point is, The most important thing is God's word. And so that's why I say when we're talking with people, let's give them Bible. Let's give them what God says and uh, kind of shy away from our opinion. The reason I want to point that out is because uh, Isaiah the prophet in chapter 55, verse 11, he put it this way. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I, I sent it. See, God's word, powerful, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, that's the thing we want to give people. In other words, back to verse 1, the people in our text heard a lot of teaching from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. But when they heard Jesus speak, it was another story. Matthew put it this way in chapter 7, verse 28, 29. He writes, when Jesus had finished saying these things, The crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So that's the the thing, God's word. The second thing I want to point out is in verses 4 and 5, we need to be teachable or else we'll miss God's blessing. We've got to be teachable. The third thing in verses 5 to 10 God's goodness overwhelms Simon's bad attitude, which helps Simon see God's goodness and his sinfulness. And doesn't that happen for you and for me? How God overwhelms us with his goodness. It's like when in our text where Jesus is put out into deep water and let the nets down for a catch. I'm sure Simon's looking at Jesus is like, brah, we just washed our nets, man. But Jesus is saying, go out, throw it on the other side. And I can hear Simon's sarcasm. Well, master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say, I'll let them down the nets. Ah, but yet, God blesses them. God gives them a catch where, oh my goodness, two boats are going to sink. You know, as we like to say here, oh, bro, he's catching choke fish. You know, he thought he knew how to fish, but uh, Jesus had a good handle on it. The fourth thing I want to point out in our text, in these verses, uh, 11 verses, is verse 10, where it says, catching men, or Jesus says, don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. For you note takers, if you want to circle the word catch men, you can write these words, to take alive, to take alive. Jesus wants to teach the guys how to catch men 
so that they can experience life. Compare that to our, our enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, let's catch men for life. I, I put it this way, you know, Simon, they went back, they went to their secular jobs, if you will, to go fishing. But I wrote this down. Verse 10, catching men is more important than our secular jobs. In other words, our secular jobs are a means to engage with people who have bit the lure of this world, which causes them to be covered with, paralyzed by, and compromised with sin. See, I've often told the teenagers, this is where I tell them, you guys are the best evangelists to your generation. If I were to walk onto Kalahel High School when, when Isaac was still there, so people would look at me and go, who's this old guy on campus? Right? I mean, I'd wear the surf shorts and the shirts and whatnot, but they'd look at me and go, this guy's old. But I've often told Isaac as well as that, you know, he's the best influence in his sphere as far as a, his, his group of peers. He could talk with them. He got their ear. And so the same I would say to each and every one of us here, where you work, you guys can relate to the people best, you know. So let God teach you how to catch men alive as well, to go fishing, if you will. Now let's take a look at uh, verses 12 to 15. Verses 12 to 15, I entitled this section, The Man Covered with Sin. The Man Covered with Sin. Or Overwhelmed by Sin. Verse 12 reads, While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Verse 14, then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go. Show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet the news about him spread all the more. So the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Some things I wanted to point out here. One of my commentaries Commentators, Kent Hughes, he uh, explained this leprosy deal in Bible times. He says, in Israel, the lot of a leper was summed up in Leviticus chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkept, cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. Kent Hughes goes on. We can hardly imagine the humiliation and isolation of a leper's life. He was ostracized from society because it was thought at that time that leprosy was highly contagious. Whenever he came in range of the normal population, he had to assume a disheveled appearance and cry, unclean, unclean. Now think about how you would feel shouting this while entering a grocery store, say Foodland, or a mall, like Winward Mall. And the pervasive sense of worthlessness and despair you would experience. By Jesus' time, rabbinical teaching, with its minute strictness, had made matters even worse. If a leper even struck, stuck his head inside a house, the house was pronounced unclean. It was illegal to greet a leper. Lepers had to remain at least 100 cubits away if they were upwind and four cubits if downwind. Josephus, the Jewish historian, summed it up by saying that lepers were treated as if they were, in effect, dead men. Dead men walking. Now, gang, Think about this for a second. This leper in our text, 
This man was once somebody's son. This individual may have been some bride's husband. This man may have been some kiddo's father. But because of this terrible disease, it may have been many, many years since he had received a loving touch, a deep embrace, and a kiss on the cheek. And as we relook at our text, we see this man covered with leprosy, and leprosy being an illustration of sin, falling before the God of love, hearing a gentle, loving voice, and, a rec and receiving a loving, cleansing touch from the caring Creator. You know, gang, when I look at this section of Scripture, I see myself. You see, according to the Apostle Paul, I was once like this leper. Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, the first five verses. He writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are dis disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So in looking back at our text, isn't Jesus, isn't Jesus awesome? Isn't his love just unfathomable? Let's review. Here's a man covered with sin, if you will, and immediately he's cleansed. Eugene Peterson put it this way in the message, then and there his skin was smooth, leprosy gone. Just like baby's skin. You know, just like you and I, we were once covered and held captive by our sinful nature and destined for hell. But in God's grace, we were able to hear his loving voice speaking to our hearts. And God caringly convicted our hearts of our sinful condition. We cried out to be cleansed like the man in our text. And like the old hymn says, for some of you, this would be very familiar. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other font I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Now let's take a look at the next section. Verses 17 to 26, I entitled this section, Paralyzed by Sin. Paralyzed by Sin. Verse 17 reads, One day as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Verse 19, when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat and go home. Verse 25, immediately he stood up 
in the front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. We have seen remarkable things today. For you note takers here, take a look. There's some, here's some things that I learned from this section of scripture. First thing I see, here's an individual who was paralyzed and, who, and he couldn't help himself. He relied on others. It's like when I talk to people and they tell me, well, it's in the Bible, Kev. God helps those who help themselves. I'm like, huh? What translation is that, bro? I mean, uh, chapter and verse, please. And um, they get upset. But it's like, it's not in the Bible. I, I use passages like this to show people. It's like, this guy couldn't do jack for himself, just like you and I. We couldn't do nothing for ourselves because of our sinful condition. For ourselves, we were paralyzed by our sin, just like this guy. The second thing I look at or I see is this individual, he had good friends. He had good friends. And these good friends, man, they're willing to do anything to get him the help. They uh, <laughs> came to the house. It was too crowded. They couldn't get in the house. They were blocked by the crowd. So they figured, let's go on the roof. Went to the roof, and then they ripped up the roof. And then they lowered him down. They didn't care how much it cost. All they were concerned about is, how can we help our friend? Because this Jesus. He healed this leper. Maybe he can heal our par paralytic friend. You know, these individual friends were willing to do anything to help. It's like Paul said in Galatians, carry each other's, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. And it's like this, these guys, they love their friends so much, their love was turned into action. Like I've often told the youth group before, love is a verb. You gotta show your love. You just can't say I love, but you know, these guys, they put their money where their mouth is, so to speak. It's like Peter would say, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. I don't know why, the text doesn't say why this guy was paralyzed, but they didn't care. They just wanted to get their friend to Jesus. The fifth thing I see is that Jesus sees and honors the faith of this individual's friends. That's pretty cool. You know, and what I see here as well is, here was a man who was physically paralyzed, but then I see a group of men, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they were spiritually paralyzed and they didn't even know it. You know, here they are getting in Jesus' face, asking these questions, and in their question, they don't even realize they're answering their question. It's hilarious, you know? And, um, you know, they're, they're paralyzed by their self-righteousness, if you will. They thought they were on it, but they were not. It's like Jeremiah 17, 9, 10 says, you know, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who could know it? These guys didn't even realize how wicked their own hearts were. But Jesus was focused on the guy in front of him. Next thing I see is that the voice that said in this text, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home, also said, let there be light. So I see God's power. And it's amazing. This guy got up, picked up his mat, strolled on out of there in front of everybody. And the sad thing is, I don't know how long this guy was paralyzed, but these Pharisees and teachers of the law, they were so blinded, so paralyzed by their self-righteousness, they couldn't be stoked for this guy to be healed. I mean, wouldn't you be stoked? It's like, what? I got up. Amazing. Praise God. But no, they, their hearts weren't in the right place. 
the next thing I wrote down in my notes is how does this how do we make application for us in this section of scripture? If you want to take note, you can put this down. Those of us who are Christian, remember someone carried you and placed you at the feet of Jesus at one time. For me, The date that flashes in my head and I put down in my notes is January 10th, 1987. That's the day I got saved. And next to that, I had to write down my friend's name, Wade. And I, re you know, what I'm getting is that there are people who prayed for you that you would come to Christ, just like for me. And this one guy in particular, I remember the night like it was yesterday where... Went to the college study. It was uh, up in the Ward Avenue area. And I heard the gospel. I realized for myself that I was covered in sin. I was paralyzed by sin. I had my addictions. I had my bondage. And God gave me ears to hear. And I heard this God who loves me. And accepted his love for me, confessed my sins, acknowledged that, God, I need you. And he came and invaded my life. And I remember that night going home over the poly. My friend Wade and I, at that time, Wade had a black Toyota Corolla. <laughs> and we were coming over. We didn't say a word to each other. There was this, this unreal, cool peace in the car. And then... Um, I'm going back to my parents' house, and my parents live across from Hawaii Memorial in Kaneohe. And for those of you who remember, before all the new houses came up, on that corner across Hawaiian Memorial used to have this uh, little pasture with a couple horses there. The Texura family used to own that property. And um, I remember we pulled over there, and we're heading up the road, and then Wade just pulls and turns the car off pulls off the road, I look at him like, what's up with you, man? <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, you know how long I've been praying for you. I was like, what? And it, he just said it again, and I sat there. Nobody ever told me that before. I've been praying for you, Kevin. Blew my mind. And I remember... Uh, this particular friend, that he loved me enough that he got on his knees to pray for me until I got saved. And um, for those of you, if you remember people who prayed for you, I would suggest this. Take the time to remember. Take the time to give them a call. Take the time to go see them or something. Tell them thanks. Tell them thanks. The next thing I wanted to add is in regards, in, in the same uh, way of these f friends that carry their par paralyzed friend, let's pray and bring our family and friends to the feet of Jesus so they can be forgiven and healed of their paralysis of sin as well. Let's take a look at the last section, verses 27 to 32. I entitled this section, The Sin of Compromise. The Sin of Compromise. <clears throat> Luke writes, Dr. Luke writes, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large, large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. Verse 30, But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. For you note takers, Levi. You can write next to Levi the word joined. Joined, that's what Levi means. And then, you know, Levi, he's Matthew, right? And Matthew, the name Matthew means gift of Jehovah. And the thing is, when we look at this passage, it's, we see that Levi, who is he joined to? Brother is a tax collector for Rome. It's like, what's up with that? And then not only that, Matthew, well, his name, Gift of Jehovah, well, Matthew's not being a gift of Jehovah to his fellow Israelites, you know, because when I, I think about Levi, I'm sure at that time when you mentioned his name, you know Levi the tax collector? Ooh, I'm sure there was a few words added or joined to his name to uh, express their feelings about him. You know, it wasn't too good. I mean, you guys know this, the background about a tax collector. They worked for Rome. They collected the taxes for Rome. But not only that, they, they collected even more tax to line their pockets. And so they weren't too well liked in their community, if you will. But I want to take note is this, is the first two words in verse 27, after this, and this is me speculating, after this, maybe, just maybe, Levi heard all the talk about Jesus' miracles, and maybe he was sick of his compromised lifestyle and wanted to change, but didn't know how. Maybe, just maybe, he thought, if this Jesus could heal a leper, which is unheard of, and cause a paralyzed guy to walk again, maybe he can change me. You know? And the thing is, despite Levi's compromise and bad reputation, I had to take note that Jesus chose him to follow him. Jesus did not care about his reputation. Mark put it this way in chapter 3, verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called him, called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. Jesus called them. I used the illustration before, like I remember in elementary school when, you know, it's kickball time, and teams are being chosen. And how many of you were the first to be chosen? And you're like, you're standing next to your friend thinking you're the man, right? But if you were the last one chosen, it's like, oh, Brian, you only chose me because you had to, you know? <laughs> and, but here, Levi's chosen by Jesus. Come follow me. And I'm sure Levi, like I said, maybe, just maybe, he heard the stories. He figures, wow, if he can do that for these guys, maybe he can pull a miracle off in my life. And what I see in this text as well is Levi, he's so stoked that Jesus chose him. He has a great banquet at his house. And I kind of call it the tax collector's union meeting. And he calls all his friends. This guy changed these people's life and he's changing my life. Maybe he can change your lives as well. And I just like Levi the evangelist here. But again, what do we see here? Kind of being the party poopers in the story is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were compromised by self-righteousness. Again, here they see this man's life being changed and because of their biting into the lure of compromise, they can't enjoy the fact that a man is being touched by God. You know, when we look at Levi, you may agree with me that Levi's lure, if you will, was the lure of riches. Paul put it this way in 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Matthew bit the, the lure of 
money, but Jesus came and touched him, got him off the hook, if you will. But I wanted to put this down as well. There's other lures in our lives, in the world that we live, that can cause us to compromise as well. And it's the, one of them is the lure of relationships. For those of us who, who are married, faithfulness is a big deal. You know, the lure of relationships. For me, I, I noted here, there's three people in my life that I'm uh, aware of that bit into this lure. And um, one of them was married 14 years to his bride and had two beautiful kids, two weeks away from making his 15th wedding anniversary, walked out on his wife and kids. He bit the lure of this relationship. I did the Matthew thing. I went to him and tried to talk to him, talk him out of it. Um, his comment to me was only, you don't understand, Kev, you don't understand. All I could tell him was, I do understand. What I do understand is I'm looking at a very selfish person for doing this. Second one, the lure of relationship that hits home for me is uh, aware of a, a, a pastor that did the same thing. Walked out on his wife and kids. Another one friend of mine, gal walks off, uh, walks away from her, uh, her marriage and her kids and her husband. For me, it just reminds me about the Proverbs where it says, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life because there's all kind of lures out there, Kev. And I don't look down on my friends. I just, I get scared because I know that, man, if these guys can go down, I can as well. <coughs> the other lure, if you will, that dangles in front of us that the devil does is the lure of the world, the lure of the world, the systems of this world, the things of this world. You know, I, I, all I put down in my notes is remember Abraham and Lot. You guys remember the story Abraham? He's got his relative Lot with him, but Thankfully, Abraham had eyes of faith where he could look smack in a hot desert and see God and walk after God. But Lot, on the other hand, what does he do? He, he, the text would say he turns and he looks towards Sodom. Then he finds himself going towards Sodom. Then he finds himself living in Sodom. And then the place, before he gets nuked, God has to go rescue him. But the lure of the world something I'm sure we can all uh, relate to. But on a happy note, I mean, one of the lures that I wrote down to be careful for is the lure of career, the lure of career. And I, I, I wrote this down. I, I penciled it in my notes, and I wrote down my friend. He, some of you know him, Pastor Frank Figueroa. Pastor Frank that guy, he has a band. Well, he had a band. It was called Theocracy AD. And it was one of those hard rock bands, speed metal. It, it's, I, I would tease their lead singer, Steve, and I, would, I wouldn't call him a lead singer. I would call him the lead yeller because um, you couldn't understand a word he was saying. But when you read the lyrics, it's like, right on. Good stuff. But Frank told me a story where they went to a thing uh, up in the mainland. It was like a Christian Woodstock. And things went over well, and people liked them. And he told me a story where um, after they performed, they were going back to their trailer, and they'd come across uh, other trailers with other Christian bands, but he'd smell pot. What's up with that? It's weed, man. We walking down, then he'd see guys coming out of their uh, trailers, bottle of Jack Daniels in hand, and so forth. And then he'd be, the, the band would look at each other and go, what is up with that? And then, like I said, they were well received at this uh, Christian Woodstock thing, and they were approached by a, a Christian label. And uh, the business guy, the 
guy that wanted to work out a contract with them came to see them put on a little small show in a club and as they're setting up and stuff, Steve and Frank and the rest of the guys, um, guy comes walking up to them, alcohol, alcohol in his breath, he's drinking screwdriver, you know, v vodka and, and, and orange juice and stuff, and he's, he's a little buzzing, and he's trying to talk to my friend folks about a, a record deal. And so I asked Frank, so wow, bro, what'd you tell the guy, man? He's all, well, he wanted to sit down with us and he was trying to give us his speech and we told him, bro, before we talk to you, you better get right with God first and repent. So, wow, well, you told him that. <laughs> so, yeah. And then Steve started telling the same thing. I'm like, no way. Needless to say, they never got the contract. <laughs> the guy laughed all upset. But, you know, Frank folks, they had the lure of career hanging in front of them, and they passed. And I tell them, thank you so much, bro, for hanging in there, doing the right thing, not being tempted by the money, not being tempted by the career, if you will. So gang, despite the lures in this life, that may try and lure us away. The scriptures put it this way for those of us who, hey, we're human, we mess up. But check it out. Matthew put it this way in chapter 18, verses 12 to 14. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. Isn't that neat that our God is such a great shepherd? So now let's review. Remember my lure illustration, this thing. Remember, we have an enemy of our souls who plots and plans and waits patiently to try and lure us away from our relationship with Jesus Christ. But we have a Savior who has lures as well, but is rooted in love for us. And what does he do? He touches our hearts and lives despite our proneness to sin. And God also uses the love of friends to help us when we are paralyzed by sin. You know, Christianity is not a Lone Ranger thing. We need each other. We need fellowship. We need the prayers of one another. We need the encouraging words. And God wants to strengthen our testimony to help us avoid the pitfalls of compromise. Okay?
Lord, we just come to you this morning to, to look for you, to see by looking, Lord, by seeking what you want us to find, Lord, what your spirit will reveal. The hope that's in us, Lord, as it unravels, as we come to you, you open our eyes and you help us to see what's right ahead. Lord, we thank you for your word that reveals the truth. And we thank you for our hearts that, that can receive you. And we can know and we can understand the depth and the height. 